welcome everyone um, to the fourth Snow Leopard Network webinar this year. And we started the webinars with a focus on the latest developments in science and conservation across the Snow Leopard range. But now today, during today's webinar, we hope to take a look back. So not only are reflections of past conservation efforts, but also to look forward and remind ourselves of the lessons learned and maybe things that we have overlooked um, from the past. So the experiences of our guest speaker are extraordinary and really important. And we are really delighted to have welcome today Ragu to share more with us. And we also have Kustup who will be here facilitating the session. So thank you Kustup. And without any delay, I'm just gonna head it off to Kustup to, so you can lead the session. Thank you so much thank, everyone for joining. Thank, thank you, Justin. Um, I'm really happy to be part and come back and talk to talk about snow leopard to snow leopard people great great thank you justine and uh, good afternoon everyone so um okay let me share my screen first So you all can see the the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can yes, see. Can. Excellent. All right. So yeah, in, in 2002, a student of physics ended up in one of the most beautiful tiger reserves in India, knocking the door of one of India's leading tiger biologists. Now, with no background in ecology, the student obviously didn't manage to impress the tiger biologist, to say the least. But uh, the scientist, of, of course, was not only the, a leading scientist, he was also a very kind hearted person. So he decided to help the student out. Over the next several years, uh, the student would ritualistically prepare discussion points for a week before meeting the tiger biologist for just one hour. The tiger biologist was generous enough to loan some of his prized books that the student used so much that they all ended up getting ripped in the seams or getting smudged. 18 years later, that student, who happens to be me, is honored to interview one of the most formidable teachers and observers of natural history, Dr. Raghu Chundavad. Now, uh, I would like to start by thanking you, Justine and Raki, for the, uh, at the Snow Leopard Network for this session today, where we hope to time travel to the 1980s and 1990s and learn about the initial years of uh, Snow Leopard research and conservation. Uh, not just in India, but across the world. Uh, and uh, there's just one housekeeping announcement that if you have any questions, please do share them in the chat window and we'll be more than happy to take them up once we have exhausted the first set of questions that I've tried to put together. So uh, let's start with this picture, sir. Um, I believe that uh, that uh, young boy is you and that picture is taken in central India. Now, for someone who grew in Madhya Pradesh, which is also known as the Tiger State of India, how come you got involved with snow leopards? Um, thank you, Costa, first of all. And I think I, I learned, now learning, and I've got more from you than I've given it to you um, when we first met and we were doing the research. So uh, it was a pleasure and uh, I'm so happy that we're talking about something uh, I was very uh, passionately associated with um, in very early in my life. Um, as a young boy, I grew up with my father, who was a dad at uh, that time. It was just a range, uh, and it was um, Kana. Um, uh, he was a DFO Mandla who looks after the Kana National Park. So I had uh, that background where we used to go and see, and discussions were about conservation and all. But when I was in college in school, Academics was not in my mind. I was a cricketer, wanted to play cricket professionally. I did play. Uh, I joined bot botany because it was the easiest way to get into the university uh, because there was a sports quota. But um, <clears throat> it was just a chance that I saw an advertisement um, that they, they are looking for a botanist. And I had um, empty season not to play cricket. So I thought it will be a paid holiday for me. Uh, the thing was that... Um, <clears throat> I um, used, my father had a, um, somebody, uh, a relation 
who had hunted in Ladakh and had all these trophies in his house. And I used to go and watch these um, uh, weird looking creatures. And I used to ask him how they, they look, how did they, you find it? Then these were fascinating stories where he six months he walked you know, in the mountains. So I always wanted to go and see these, um, but I've never been to the Himalaya. So getting into the snow leopard was, um, it just was thinking as a paid holiday and then I will come back um, to play cricket, but it never happened. Great. And I think this picture is uh, from the first ever survey that uh, was conducted in India, I believe, on snow leopards. Yeah, when I joined, I was complete in a completely independent. Never had been to Himalaya. I had, I made new five birds. I had few names I knew, um, and um, I was also somewhat stupid in a way, uh, just because of ignorance. Um, the, the people you see here. So I was the junior most, knew very little, tucked at the back. Um, the Joe Fox uh, led the team. Uh, you had S.P. Sena, who had done his PhD by then on lions. Pallav Das was from Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. He was a sociologist and I was a botanist who knew nothing about botany. But um, Joe Fox then helped me quite a bit, um, uh, identifying some plants. So then we had a book of Himalayan and then I learned a bit um, about these uh, plants and things. But it was thing that my time with father and going into the forest, natural history, uh, was very strong in, um, in, in inculcated in me. So very quickly I picked up and um, then we, me and Joe got together and it, it was quite, a, quite an experience. Thank you. Now, I must mention here, and those people who know you would agree with me that you're famous for your storytelling. People still talk about your stories, not just you, but about the stories you tell years after, uh, even if after years of not having met you. But uh, to me, uh, uh, it also reveals uh, uh, a side that makes one person a fine natural historian, because for years I've been in awe of your ability to observe minute details and look at surroundings in very unlikely perspectives. Uh, uh, could you please uh, talk a bit about how these helped you study snow leopards during a time when there was no camera traps, no satellite images, no uh, GPS telemetry and so on? That's true because then there was, we had no other options but to spend time, as much time as possible uh, to get the information. Um, so there's a lot of time in the field. So like in Ladakh, uh, I used to live there uh, for about 11 months in a year. Um, so, so the amount of time you spend in the field is what you learn uh, a lot about from the, uh, about the animal. And that's what the big difference that we lived there. Uh, animal was all around. The snow leopard was not visible, but we knew is around. Um, and nature history is understanding of nature history helped us collect the information. Okay. I think this one uh, <laughs> probably would mention, I, I'm, I'm not sure if Joe's in the audience here, but I think this was the first time you ever put on skis. And I, uh, yeah, but there are a lot of expert skiers, including Justine here. So <laughs> it'll be fun to get to know how was yeah, it. Yeah, no, uh, it, 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 it was a very interesting story because we uh, went to Rumbak, uh, Rangdom, which is, uh, I think, the coldest place in, after Siberia and India. People generally talk about drought, but this is what, and we came out in the winter uh, and December, late December or something. And after Christmas holidays, then we back, we went back uh, and very deep snow, about two to two meters at least. And nobody has made it to the Rangdom Valley um, during the winter. And we had taken about 40 porters. Um, we had snowshoes. Joe gave me about half an hour. Um, uh, workshop uh, on how to use skis and we were off for 120 kilometers in these mountains and uh, second day all we when we got up uh, all the porters are gone because the day before we had seen about 13 or 14 avalanches and one was quite huge in front of us it came it was so big that the valley got filled up and was came on the other our side of the valley um, in, in the night we were thinking that whether we should also go back or not but in the morning when we got up uh, 
the photos have gone then we decided maybe it's better than we will try on our own so we <clears throat> tried one day and the, the second big uh, avalanche broke our spirit and then we came back um but it's an experience i will remember um ever because those 40 50 kilometers on cross country in two and a half meter deep snow was a nightmare because if you fall there are fixed skis so if you fall upside down you had to reach to the skis to unlock it and get your leg free and then like you like you know like in the water you have to come up uh from the snow up and i must be doing it for at least 10 10 times uh a day or something like that it was it was very um, very difficult experience for me. <laughs> Certainly, I can imagine. But I cannot imagine, actually. Okay, so let's get back to the survey, sir. Uh, and this image, uh, I think it shows the incredible diversity of the landscape that Ladakh is. Now, if I may ask a very naive question, what really surprised you the most when you got to Ladakh? Well, when I went there, you have heard about is the cold, frozen area, cold, uh, snow and I was expecting snow everywhere. Um, but when I first arrived in October, there was hardly any snow, even up on in the peaks, peaks were hardly any snow. So that was one thing. And second was breathing. I've never nobody told me about the high altitude uh, sickness, high breathing problem, uh, things like that. So that was <clears throat> something completely hit me by a surprise. Um, uh, but it's the distances uh, was so deceptive because you will think, oh, I will go two hours and come back, but it will end up just reaching there for um, you know half a day. Uh, so these are some of the things I had to get edges to, and um, there was um, this was a quick um, learning for me uh, those uh, first couple of weeks. And Ladakh is actually um, quite a very diverse. So, um, the main Himalayas, you go on the other side, on the west, you it's narrow valleys, very rugged mountains. But the moment you go towards the east, it opens up and it becomes self drain areas like Tibet. And you have very wide valleys, rolling hills, but valley flows are very, very high, uh, above 4,000 meters. So uh, very different habitat, different. And the, the people think in the mountains that um, the ridges and the mountain ranges are the barrier, but they are not um, a barrier for most of the the radiation and dispersals and movements of animals, but it's the valleys which joins them. So if you look at association up on the northern bit of the uh, the and the source of the Indus and where it meets the sea. If you look at the flora association, communities, speciation, the, the valleys have played significant, and those valleys are unfortunately also being now uh, heavily inhabited, and that kind of now uh, natural process is being blocked. Mm, those something uh, some of the biggest uh, conservation issues uh, we're dealing with um, uh, in the mountain systems. Sure, thank you. Um, okay, now uh, I'm, I'm sure you have a, a story to tell about these simple, naive looking uh, pug marks. Oh, well, um, when we went there, we knew almost nothing because the, the brief when uh, Snow Leopard Trust, Helen came, Joe Fox came, and we were talking how we were going to go about it. And we, the, the brief was that we may, after nine months of survey, we may not be able to see even Snow Leopard signs. So don't that get discouraged and you know things like that. The only picture that time was George Scheller has taken in Pakistan. That was the only picture uh, from the wild. And so when we saw um, the Snow Leopard first sign in Rangdum Valley, and we sent the pictures and the uh, note which Joe wrote, it became an international news. It was headline news in CNN, BBC. We didn't know at that time, but on the radio, we could hear, hear the news um, <clears throat> and it became international. So you can imagine how much interest was there in, internationally as the, on, on this survey about Snow Leopard right from the beginning, but we knew very little. But since then we have moved on so much now we don't talk about tracks, but we use tracks and we look at from different perspectives. We're talking about abundances, uh, we uh, camera tapping, we look at different ways of food habit. When we were talking about, we were just interested, what is their feeding? What are their main prey? What are their alternate prey? Now you're looking at it in a much more global perspective. You look at new publications. Uh, so it's so much more work has been done on Snow Leopard that now uh, science has progressed. My 
the phd was uh, quite a lot on natural history it has its value well, maybe first 10 years but since then things have moved on the work it's been done is quite commendable thank you um right now i recollect you mentioned that both you and joe uh visited uh, Srinagar immediately after the survey for a conference. Uh, what was this symposium and uh, how, why was it important or what was the main outcomes from the symposiums? If you could tell us more about that, that would be exciting. The survey results were very encouraging about the snow leopard status because before the first time our project was done where we covered very, very large area, almost entire Northwest Somalis um, and the signs were everywhere. And in fact, in, in, in from Ladakh, it was very, very uh, encouraging because not only we saw signs everywhere, but the abundance we saw, and we had great success in spotting two snow leopards, which we never thought we would be able uh, to do that. So, it, so the, the world was looking forward to uh, listen to us um, from uh, the survey results. And when symposium happened, it was a kind of watershed for snow leopard conservation in, in India because the government of India so excited by the survey results that they actually announced long, uh, 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 they're going to launch a snow leopard project in India. Uh, actually, a draft was uh, discussed there. Um, and I was caught there. Um, I, I remember one the dinner there, there I was invited and was there, Joe was there. Um, in, I think Dave Ferguson, other people were there. And then they said, why don't I do a PhD? And I was still thinking of my cricket back. And um, that's where the decision was made that I will do my PhD. I was offered a uh, fellowship in the um, Washington University, Seattle, and also in Fort Collins. But that didn't happen because that, those days, these areas were these areas were in uh, inner line and permits were required. The home ministry clearance won't come. So I registered here in Rajasthan, um, but the, the symposium is where the project Snow Leopard started in India. A PhD was, uh, um, and the government said that they will support, and they all the conservation measures uh, from there uh, just took off. And I believe Helen Freeman, the, the founder of the Snow Leopard Trust, had an important role in getting you uh, on board to the, the mission PhD. If I may say so. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, actually, I, I was not very keen. So that dinner and Helen was uh, the force behind, and she, she didn't take any argument of mine. Uh, and I couldn't tell them that. <laughs> I couldn't tell them that I wanted to go and play cricket. And, uh, but yes, I, yeah, by the time um, I had what was infected by the snow leopard um, scene, and uh, uh, I didn't want to. Um, uh, there was a doubt that uh, maybe uh, I will go back, but I think after uh, support, which was shown to me, and Helen was just said, no, uh, she's not going to let me go. Uh, we have to do PhD, and, uh, and I did yeah, agree with her. Great. I just noticed Joe has just joined in. Hi, Joe. Welcome to this meet. I'm so sorry. It's super early for you, but if you can hear us, can you just say hi? <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, it's a bit early in the morning. I can imagine. And we were just going through this fantastic image of you and Raghu. And uh, I, I really had a question for you, that, <laughs> which was basically, uh, how did it go getting a complete uh, newbie into the snow leopard landscape? And we just went through a picture of of uh, both of you trying to ski all the way to Rangdong. And... <laughs> 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 so, so uh, can you share a little more about that? How, how was it, uh, the, the first ever survey that uh, you both went together on? Well, I, I mean, it was quite an adventure having, uh, I mean, Raghu was one of three other folks from India there that were part of a group from the Wildlife Institute that, um, and I, I'm sorry, I wasn't here a little earlier, so I don't know what he's talked about, but um, uh, there were three others, and we spent almost a year traveling through Jammu and Kashmir and uh, Himachal Pradesh. And, I was talking, uh, Joe, that how good you were in teaching me cross-country skis. <laughs> yeah, right. I re remember that <laughs> attempt. We, did, we didn't do it more than once. I know that. <laughs> no, no. I, we did it second time in Norway. You remember? 
in oh, yeah, the middle of the true. night. You... Mm. Fantastic. Hey, thanks, Joe. Thanks very much for joining in. I'll, I'll come back to you. There might be some more uh, tidbits I would like to know, and especially the story about the uh, 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 the herbivores surrounding him. So I, I'll come back to you with that. Well, I do have one 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 question, and that is whether I know this has to do with Helen, but I wonder whether Raghu knows the the story about when Mira and I Tula came to Seattle and initiated the the um, what ended up being the survey. Has he already talked about that? I don't think no. so. Well, I should tell that a little bit later, whenever you want. Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Joe. We'll, we'll get you back on. Okay, so uh, anyway, so, so before you knew it, I think you were in Ladakh to pursue a PhD, but uh, I think what's remarkable is that you didn't just spend those five, six years doing your PhD in Ladakh, uh, studying what people call as the ghost of the mountain. Uh, you spent 15 years out there uh, so how did you plan uh, initially to study the species that people could barely see? I mean, I remember you started by saying that, you know, the only picture people had uh, was one by George Shadow and uh, it was kind of seeing pug marks made international news. So, so what, what did you have in mind uh, going forward? Well, when you are young, you know, and inexperienced, you, you go and you take risks, which uh, I will not do it now or anybody will do it now. So we, I had no idea. I was told uh, that we will do this, we will do it. And I said, yes, we will do it. And, and I was with full of energy and think, yes, yeah, we will, you can catch snow leopard. I said, we will catch snow leopards. And, and we just went there. Um, <clears throat> but then realized that uh, seeing snow leopard is very, very difficult. We, in the first six months, I think I saw maybe a couple of times that that was it. Um, so the only uh, way I could get information was following the tracks uh, and trying to characterize the habitat used by snow leopard um, uh, and then, you know, learn. So th th doing that was a really wonderful thing happened to me because following the tracks was like um, reading a book on natural history for me because then you pick up a fresh tracks and then you follow. First, I have to learn the the art of picking up uh, and following it for as long as possible. Sometime, I think maximum I have followed it over 11 kilometers, the same set of tracks, but it, it took me a long time to do that. And, um, <clears throat> and but you, you see things which you otherwise miss out that how uh, on us, especially when it's snow, you see how it has uh, stopped and tried to catch uh, uh, mouse hairs or hair. Um, and, you know, you see how they are moving differently when they are hunting with their, um, and what kind of terrain they're using when they are moving long distances, how they are moving, how they use the, the cover, where the cover, you know, the break in terrain, break in color, is all these things which they use. And then you, you learn. Um, it, was a, it, it was fantastic for me uh, following the tracks because you, it was like, uh, it was a book on natural history which I read. Um, but it was very, very tiring. Um, and then we used to collect information on a lot of prey. We collected the scat. It was a, the PhD was basically basic natural history, documentation of natural history uh, on a snow leopard, what it feeds, where it moves, what kind of terrain it um, rests, uh, uh, what kind of prey species we have, what, what kind of relationship um, snow leopard had with these preys, uh, what kind of conflict uh, if, uh, at all there. So those kinds of some some very very basic stuff, yeah. Sure, sounds great. Yeah, sounds fun. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there must be been a lot of walking. And uh, did your knees behave all right uh, with all that walking uh, in those mountains? And that too with, with not a lot of training uh, beforehand. Well, first first couple of years was fine. Um, but then what had happened was my going down, I always hit it. And it, because of the, one of the knees started giving me trouble. And when I came to Delhi and Dehradun, uh, I went to the doctors and they said that it has to be operated. As long as you can bear the pain, you bear it. And then, but sometimes it used to can kind of get blocked and I just very painful to straighten my knees. And, and one, if you see this picture, um, this is the Amchi, the local, uh, um, the, Kind of a doctor who uses uh, Tibetan medicine, um, and I was 
camping and waiting for a horse to come and to take me back to Leh so that I can then again. So he came, uh, he going, was going past and he said, what happened? And we had a tea and he said, okay, he can give me a medicine. medicine. Um, so I said, fine. So he gave me, a, I think, 14 packets, I remember. And he said, you have to boil it for half an hour, strain it and drink it. And I may, it was, a, it was a horrible drink. Uh, every night I have to do that. It was, um, it was uh, very torture. I may have done about eight or nine of them. Uh, but the pain disappeared. There was some mild pain, but it disappeared. It never came back. And after that, I thought I, I will take try this medicine with several other people who had knee problems. It never worked, but it worked for me like a magic. Wonderful. The blessings of the mountains. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so you, you you mentioned the telemetry very briefly, uh, the radio calling snow leopards. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think you were the first person to ever call her a snow leopard in India. Uh, let me ask to begin with, how did you manage to catch a snow leopard for collaring? And then, of course, you know, how was was it fun to follow that cat uh, thereafter? No, it, catching, trapping was an uh, see, trapping, I think it's an art, it's not a science. Usually scientists think that it's, you know, you read a paper about it and you go there and do it. it it's, it's an art. You, it takes time, it's with the experience it comes. Uh, and then the leg hold snares, which is used uh, uh, nowadays quite, quite successfully, we didn't have that, we couldn't import it. And plus, I think at the Institute, they said, no, we will not allow that to happen, no, to use it because it can damage. things. So they were worried, so we were not using this. And the cages design, I decided to make it from the local material. Um, and uh, when I looked at the designs, they were all bulky and I couldn't carry that. And if you look at the scientific papers which are written, they say how big there should be, there will be a separate cage for the bay, uh, how the door should fall silent, um, silently, fast as much possible, then the, how to protect the tail and all. Um, and it was not possible for me to do this because budget was very, very small. Um, so I, through a contact, I came to know about somebody in central India who has trapped about 400, uh, 600 leopards. And he told me everything which is, was against the scientific papers were written. He said, you don't have to make two, two cages uh, and for the snow leopard and for the bait. The, when the animal trips the door, it should make noise, it should come down very slowly. Uh, and, it, and when it trips the door, uh, animal should be half in, inside and half outside. It was completely, and it, the cage inside should be as narrow as possible. Um, so it was completely uh, against the thing, and exactly the same thing happens. The idea was that he says that when animal trips, goes to the goat and trips uh, the wire, is half outside and half inside. Um, and the door, trip, the door makes noise and comes down slowly, he turns around and the door sh shuts in front of him. And so the whole body comes inside with the tail. And so he knows the only escape is where he came and he saw the door shutting. We will sit there, not even make an attempt to kill the girl. And exactly, we did three snow leopards escape, but third one we got. But we had serious problems with magpies because they will get into the cage, trip the wire, door will be shut. So we initially had five traps were set up and we thought we will manage it, but we couldn't because we have to do it in the morning. We have to go in the afternoon because uh, sometime animal will come in the daytime if you're not gone in the morning and uh, looked at the door is shut um, by the uh, magpie, then whole day if the animal goes past and we, we have lost so many opportunities like this. So we had to go morning and evening. We could do three. And this, this snow leopard, when I caught, I was way up on the ridge and I threw the binocular, I checked, I saw the door shut and I was cursing my pies. And I said, again, it happens. I came down. It's interesting because this is the closest I've been to snow leopard ever. Um, and I and came, usually the goat will hear and make noise, so she it didn't make. Uh, and also, uh, when it makes noise, the magpie will make flutter around. There was a noise. So it was complete silent. So I realized there was something wrong. So I, I had a rope which is outside for the goat when I shook it, and the goat started bleating. So I realized now goat is alive. What is it? 
they drop the uh, cage. So I cautiously go to the ground, lifted the door up about five inches or something. And I was trying to look inside and this no leopard face was like maybe six centimeters, seven centimeters from me looking at me. So we had eye to eye contact. I closely shut the door down and um, um, slept in the night there so that it doesn't escape. And next I have to the opportunity to really follow. Now the key was how to get the injection. Uh, um, so, that, so I have to put my hand, feel the tail, pull it out. And it was very friendly animal, I tell you. I once picked up his hind leg and pulled it out. Um, uh, but I finally managed to get the tail out, gave um, the injection there, and then managed to put the radio collar on it. So that's the, in the pictures you see, I'm pulling the tail out, giving an injection, and then putting radio collar on these images. Wow. Well, <laughs> the talk about a friendly animal. Uh, all right, sir. Uh, I'll, now, this one is an, again, a, a sort of an interesting set of images. The le on the left is what we typically see of tents being used, but on the right is a strange looking um, uh, uh, parachute. almost parachute like thing. So, what, what, what was this? We, we, Snow Leopard, um, yeah, when we were doing and following, we had. Uh, <clears throat> a set of uh, circuit which I used to do and we used to camp outside um, and I used to camp about 20 days a month uh, out um, and doing that and when we had ready collared snow leopard we used these tents also but the the small uh, two men was the whole for 50 percent of my time in Ladakh where we used to camp outside and especially this in the Hussein Valley I, there was a place in the winter where we used to camp, which the river stream is frozen. And there was just enough space uh, for one tent on one side of the river. And there was another uh, space, which is on the other side of the tent. So the boys used to sleep in this parachute. And I had and, and I used to hate this tent because I was so tired of for two years, changing my clothes, lying up on my back and putting the clothes on, taking it off, taking the shoes, putting shoes on. Um, but the interesting thing in this place was that the, once the dinner is, I have finished my dinner, I had a stainless steel plate, which you, I used to chuck it uh, the, to, so that it skids through the icy stream and goes on the other side to the, um, the kitchen tent. And um, sometime it will not go all the way, it will stay there. and. We will hear the noise in the night and we'll get up in the morning. We'll see snow leopard has come and um, uh, licked on the plate and gone. Um, I tried many times uh, uh, to um, see it. I tried to get up as slowly, as silently possible, but I was never managed. But once I did slept um, with the, the door open with the torch on and my, I saw it very, very close to me. Um, <clears throat> maybe about five feet, it's licking, two of them actually licking the plate, uh, but, but not bothered by my torch and my watching, uh, and then carried on. Yeah. Wow. Although... Okay, now, again, I mean, you've just mentioned one of those exciting uh, sightings, but uh, uh, let me just, okay. Now, we, we all know, of course, by now, that you're pulling the tail of the snow leopard and uh, it's still pretty, uh, uh, cooperative but so let's say snow leopards are among the more gentle animals but uh, so i'm just wondering what encounter would you call as your scariest one any with a snow leopard or uh, with another species uh, i believe yeah, uh, in the field every day something used to happen uh, but in this picture when you're looking at it but because you know the data was coming and i was not able to uh, read, follow the snow, snow leopard because I remember <clears throat> I was one day uh, I decided that I will have to take the location no matter what happens and I followed it for 21 days and I couldn't see snow leopard at all um, and when I came back to lay and the, in the evening I put the signal and I, it was there and uh, so I realized then that I actually I was not try, getting any information of snow leopard range actually I was plotting my own ability to track snow leopard um so i was gave up on this and then we were looking at 
because George Scheller has written a lot of um, uh, about blue sheep, whether it's a goat or a sheep. So we were thinking of maybe for PhD to supplement my PhD and strength to it, we will collect behavioral data during the rut and we can write a chapter on it. And I was used to go out and take observations of, during the rut. And in this particular group, I was watching it. And you have to sit out in the open so the animal know that you're there, they get used to it and they behave normally. And you're not hiding an unknown entity and they're scared of you. And when you have a large male uh, in, the, in the rutting group, then it can dominate and it, there's some sense. Um, it's, it's, it's not chaos, chaos there, but when you have similar size males and then they chase the one female in Easter and become really chaotic and she clearly sometimes uh, try to escape and in this case she tried to escape and came <clears throat> down running and be behind her about six or seven these males were and I thought they're going to trample me so it was a scree slope and I started running down leaving all my stuff and these then uh, maybe about 10, 15 steps I must have taken, then I realized they've all gone past me already. <laughs> <laughs> and then I stopped and I have to go um, collect uh, all this. But you know, th th it always happened. There's another pretty funny story actually, in fact, is that we were going, in the summertime, the horses on tourism uh, you know, trackers were hiding it, so then nothing was available. So we were using donkeys and we were going over a ridge and the, our luggage was on, on those two donkeys and I was ahead um, um, and then the, it was a very narrow ridge so you, it was like a v-shaped turn so you go and turn and they would, so I pushed them up up to the ridge and I thought I will take a breather and just scan the slope and then when I finished and I tried to go up I saw that the donkeys are still there you know the three of them they're still there and so I got up and see to see why, what happened and I was trying to push, nothing has happening. Then I looked in the front, the, the first donkey, the one wolf has caught his throat and it was stretching his, and may not making the noise. The other two was to escape from those uh, other uh, wolf has put their chins on top of the back of the first one, the second one, uh, third one on the top of two. And they were, completely steady, still uh, doing nothing. And I tried to scream at the wolf, nothing happened. I threw my water bottle at it, nothing. Finally, I had to take out my rucksack and has to you know, beat him up to actually release the grip and escape. Luckily, it was uh, not caught hold of the trachea. Uh, there was, it was only the injury on the skin. So we had to abundant thing, bring it back, give it a medication, it survived. But it was quite funny. These donkeys were, you know, with their head on on top of others back escaping from and not doing it not running not doing anything just quietly waiting for somebody to come and rescue so joe uh, can can i request you to uh, to come in please uh, uh, I'm, I'm i'm sure you have some interesting uh, stories to tell about uh, you know some of those experiences and especially i remember the one where you thought that uh, you know uh, you, you you saw a, a herd of uh, I think was it blue sheep and then you saw Raghu was right bet between them. Uh, would you would you be able to <laughs> tell more about that because it's been years since you haven't haven't heard that story from you. Well, uh, you're gonna have to tell me a little bit more about it. I'm pretty old now. My memory is not that good. <laughs> uh, I what think was... he's talking about. I was uh, talking about when we crossed the Shingola and I had a headache, uh, altitude sickness, and passed out, and the ibex was surrounding me, or something like that at the at the base. I don't when know. I can't remember. <laughs> Fair enough. No, That's I, fine. <laughs> yeah. but, but. No, I thought I would just mention that, um, I mean, the, the uh, survey project that we all started out on and that started Raghu's career with regard to Snow Leopard all started because the, um, and Raghu, maybe <coughs> you, <coughs> excuse me, you can remind me the the fellow um in ayatollah who was the was he like the director of the fish and he wildlife department in srinagar in jammu and kashmir what was his position he was the chief wildlife warden of the state right okay chief wildlife warden and yeah. uh um when helen freeman um was first getting involved with uh, 
the curating of snow leopards at the zoo in Seattle, uh, she was told that there was a person out who had come into the lobby of the zoo and had asked to see her and they told her that he was from Kashmir. And there's a, a little town in the state of Washington, not too far from Seattle, up in the mountains, called Kashmir. And she thought it was just somebody from there that had come and wanted to talk to her. So uh, he sat out there for quite a while, um, uh, waiting for her uh, to come get him. And she brought him in, and it turned out it was uh, Mira Nayatola asking her if he could have some of the snow leopards from the zoo to reintroduce into um, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, that's what, that was the basis for the project to see if that was really necessary there. And uh, basically we decided that there was enough snow leopards there to try to, um, to save uh, rather than the problems of reintroducing zoo animals. Okay, that that that's that's fantastic, Joe. Thank thanks for that insight. I had never heard about this. About yeah, it's very, very, yeah, very very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, so coming back uh, uh, to I think, and this could be a question to both of you. Now, uh, can we safely say, and we know Rumbuk is today called the snow leopard capital of the world. Can we safely uh, say that partly your research and presence. Uh, is uh, is uh, is responsible for that, or uh, or was there more to it? Well, it's the long term presence is very very key. And things see when when I finished my um, PhD and uh, um, we wanted to do some conservation work in Rumbak area, um, there was um, in the in a similar time the the department has started compensation schemes and. That changed the entire mindset of the local community because before that, any wolf is killed or a top damage, it was there, animals lives with them. But the moment forest department came and started giving compensation, it becomes their animal making damages. Uh, so the whole mindset is set. And so we thought maybe we should do some incentives programs and you know bring in some um, ben economic benefits. And um, in we actually Joe was the, the principal investigator. We started this um, um, Earthwatch groups, and that actually brought quite a lot of quite a significant amount of uh, incentives. But more than that, there was some some of the things which we did was not intentionally that we will do, and then this conservation program will happen and success will happen. But some of the thing nothing not related to um, uh, uh, conservation, but things like if a community wanted a generator for their their gompa there because they needed when there's a problem and so when we were we were as a group joe i don't know whether you remember there's one of the group we collected the money and we gave a uh, 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 generator to them and you know and then we decided to do con contributing every group i took every group which came to the snow leopard trails and things like that money uh, and the horses we are so that really started you know at the time when the community needed some support in any form, not only um, in terms of uh, um, just money, but in terms of when needed support, some needed a fellowship, some children needed an education. You know, when you do that, the trust builds up and then they, they start uh, become um, uh, much more uh, active participant in the work you've been doing and, and then join you. And so it, it kind of snowball, had a snowball effect. Um, and then we focused in this, uh, every year we used to take three, four groups there and that made a big difference. Then we started doing some programs with um, homestays started, um, uh, Rinchin, uh, who used to come and work with us in the, the Earthwatch group, trained uh, by the time he was quite well-trained guide and, and he was wanted to do conservation work. Then he started this homestays project there that brought in some more in incentives. And the, slowly, slowly, the the people's relationship changed. And the earlier, I remember there was a there was a fresh kill of snow leopard was found. They will pick the whole or a sheep, a blue sheep, will take it away and feed it up. But I remember the one thing 
where we were there and then they saw where they were coming to pick us up they saw a fresh kill and there was a debate happened between them and actually they decided not to lift the kill came to us and showed uh, that there was a snow leopard in there and could see it for two three days and slowly slowly the snow leopard was relationship changed and they become more uh, they were not as shy as they were when i was there and then you started seeing the snow leopard then you know a lot of the films were made we a couple of films we we did and then the bbc went and i still continue to go the national geographic came in so all this bring brought in quite a lot of interest funds uh, livelihoods uh, and really changed the scene for rumbak um, but it's the yes if you look at it wherever you have a continuous research project long term presence and then it turns into a conservation program there is always a success so the kibber is another one example ule is another one rumbak is one uh, so long term presence and working with community not necessarily always addressing the issue of conservation just the support when they need is essential uh, in any form um, that can help uh, bring community uh, and make them an active partner and that's what we need an active conservation partner and if community on our side of the conservation fence then there is no conflict great thank you thank you sir uh, now I, i i i wanted to skip this one but i can't because this is uh, Uh, this is an important uh, question as well so it's it's just about going back to the i think both your and joe's first snow leopard encounter in the first survey um, and if i'm not mistaken this is about a tug of war between two very unlikely candidates uh, would love to uh, hear more about this one yeah joe missed this um, <laughs> sighting because we we've been surveying for a long time there was a hot spring And Joe said, "Okay, I'm going to take a bath in Hot Springs. So you find a place to camp." So uh, I had gone ahead, um, and the other two teams, the two persons were in different group, and they were uh, surveying different areas. And I met um, a person and asked him whether he's seen a snow leopard. He said, "Oh, come back, come with me." So yesterday, the snow leopard has killed a uh, goat here. and um so i said good good uh, the rest is there he said no no it's not there it's gone um so i decided to camp up there uh, sent a message to the fox to joe they're saying that we camping it here and the horses are i we were all pitching our tent and i was actually also pitching my tent then i heard noise noises all over the place you know chaos complete and i I uh, heard noise like shan shan which is like snow leopard snow leopard so by the time i got up i saw a man carrying a goat on his shoulder and he saying that snow leopard has come back and has killed goat. and then i heard the saw go a uh, girl running and so i followed it um, and she was on the other side of the river and um, then i realized that um, she is pulling something uh, and shouting when screaming and you know really um, agitated so i jump the stream it was half frozen and i completely wet myself knee deep with and it was january it was very very cold minus i think maybe 13 14 or something like that but who cares that time was such much adrenaline excitement just to see snow leopard if is there then when i went to the close to the girl then i realized the snow leopard was holding on to the boat um, and she was cut it out Uh, and so I I'm, didn't I'm have sorry, the camera. Uh, so can to... you can you switch off your uh, video? We we actually lost the that part uh, maybe because of the connectivity. Uh, so we heard you. I think till you were saying that uh, the snow leopard was, and then I think I lost at least. Sorry. A snow leopard was what? Uh, no, I, I could only you... hear that you you ran and you saw the girl holding uh, on to. Uh, so she was holding and trying to pull the goat, and then I realized. on the other side it was snow leopard holding the goat so the, both were trying to hold on to the goat finally uh, and then um, then i thought i should take a picture so i ran back um uh, for my camera uh, and then when by the time i came she has already i met her halfway uh, she um, has uh, al- already had two um, goats on her backpack and uh, she was crying and running away uh, towards the village 
and then we started looking for the snow leopard. Uh, we could see it, but we couldn't see it clearly from the same side of the river. So we had to go across, um, and uh, that picture is taken from across the river. And by the time Joe Fox had come, and I, Joe will remember that we were sitting watching on the other side with telescope and camera, and we were served hot pakuras and tea. <laughs> <laughs> what luxuries, <laughs> what luxuries <laughs> for a snow leopard sighting. Uh, okay, so I, I think there is a very interesting question that we just got, and I'll just take this opportunity to get some questions because we are uh, we're kind of, we've sort of run close to the uh, end of the one hour. But uh, I think one of the question is, uh, which, uh, which says, what surprised you in the last 40 years? And the question is open to both you and Joe. Uh, in the last 40 years related to snow leopard conservation and research. So what, what's the most surprising yep. part for you uh, in the last 40 years in terms of both research as well as conservation wise? Joe, why don't you go ahead first? What's most surprising? I guess, uh, well, okay, now you can hear me, right? We hear you, Joe. Okay. Um, What's most surprising, I guess, is how how rapidly things changed in a place like Rumbuk um, from, and I know Raghu described it a little bit in terms of how the, the research work there led to conservation efforts and so on. But uh, things have changed so fast there in terms of how the conservation developed, but also how the, um, the whole life of people there has, has changed. Uh, and Raghu knows more about that th than I do because he's up, been up there more recently. But uh, I would just add um, to your, your question a little bit earlier to Raghu, uh, when we did our surveys all throughout um, parts of Jammu and Kashmir and Himachal Pradesh and essentially decided that the Rumbuk area was the one of the best areas and that's where Raghu ended up doing his his PhD work, that led to all the kinds of developments with people coming, making films there and things like that, just as Raghu said, and the, 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 the large changes that have taken place there is, is a result of finding that area from the first survey. So Raghu shouldn't be shy about how, how important it was to have chosen that for his initial research work. No, that's true. But um, also in terms of General Ladakh, um, Kosta, I was just thinking, um, the, the challenges have changed. Um, they, that time, uh, we have no information. Um, so the decisions were made based on guesswork, and that's a disaster. Even in, for Tiger, and generally, the, in, if you make an information without any <coughs> in, um, facts in, uh, next to you, then you end up a problem. It's a basically a guess guesstimate uh, guess work you do sometime you could be uh, would be a good um, um, guess but sometime you will end up with a problem and when you end up with a problem then because you made a decision not on science or facts it's your uh, whims and fancies then um, you become very defensive about it and it it brings it's closed down the system the system gets closed down transparency disappears so if you have based based on science, then you can discuss about, about it openly, you can discuss, you can modify, you can improve on it. So the, the, the information and decision making is if it's based on science, it does help. And, but the things have changed over 40 years. When we were there, poaching was a major issue. Joe, if you remember, we thought Uriel may not survive by the turn of the century, uh, or maybe very few may be left it's been the biggest success story because I think the, the forest department in, under the leadership of Shering Norbu spent a huge amount of time on, on anti-poaching cases and how many and people they've caught. And the, when the poaching got control, army got in uh, support uh, to us, um, it really made the huge change. That's, that was very, very significant uh, change over the years. But now Uriel has um, come back, but now road work, uh, and the habit, habitat loss, uh, all uh, the development taking place in the Uriel habitat is changing. So the challenges have changed. Even for snow leopard, the challenges have changed now because in Rumbak, 
where the entire economy was based on agriculture and livestock is not there anymore. When this time, this year I went there, there was hardly any livestock. And maybe 40% of the crop fields were um, used. So that economy has changed. And I have never seen Rumbak uh, slopes as lush as last year I saw. So what impact it will have on uh, snow leopard, we need to know. And the challenges are changing. So we have to uh, adapt ourselves. We should have information. We have, we have a science which is growing so that we can address those issues. So while we are at change, there's a very nice question. Thank you, uh, Tony. For uh, Tony Linham from WCSE is asking, Raghu and Joe, how has technology changed the way you do science? And I think this was a question we would have anyway come to a little later, but thanks, thanks Tony for asking it anyway. I think that's a very interesting question and it would be really helpful to, to you, get your insights. Hugely, you know, hugely, yes. It's amazing what now you can do. And the, I think biggest technology which has helped wildlife people is the GPS. So you can find your locations. Uh, so GPS has really made uh, um, really see. And then satellite tracking, uh, you can put radio callers and monitor. Uh, because when I was tracking, but half of the time I will not know whether animal is on the this side of the valley or on the other side of the valley. I will go up and down the opposite slope thinking that it is on the other side and realize it was on this same side of the slope I was going up and down. Um, so now you have GPS locations within five meters, um, uh, plus minus, it's just uh, technology has really made huge difference. But the only problem the other day we were discussing, Kostav, is that too much reliance on data. People think that the data becomes the fact. It's something we have to be really careful for. Data is there to help us to reach the fact. The data, you, the men you talk to some people and you say, no, no, this may not be true. You say, no, no, I have got the data. If you got the data, doesn't mean it's, it, it's the truth. Data is, is a tool to reach to the truth. And sometimes it, you may not be, the data may not be able to take you to the truth. So we have to be open to that. Um, and, and wildlife science is, is, is very, very true. Um, so too much reliance on data can be a problem, but the, it has really changed um, and I think we not exploited uh, the importance of technology in collecting the information and making those informed decisions. We are still making our decision based on our whims and fancies. I think we should stop that. Thank you. That, that, that's a very good point. Joe, would you like to comment on, uh, on both, of course, how technology has changed, but also the other point that uh, Raghu mentioned, which is that of uh, uh, the value of data versus natural history. Ideally, there shouldn't be a conflict between the two. They are kind of, uh, you know, built in, they should be built into each other. They should be fused into each other, but there seems to be at times this, uh, you know, the separation between the two, two worldviews uh, of, uh, and, and all, almost as if natural history is something to set, to be kept aside. Uh, love to hear your uh, views as well on that. Well, I would, I would just say that um, I mean, one thing that wasn't brought up is the uh, the value of um, uh, the DNA technology, which has allowed <clears throat> identification of um, scats to be sure that they were from snow leopard for identifying um, diet and things like that, as well as um, relatedness of different snow leopard populations and things like that. As far as the uh, um, uh, juxtaposition of data and and in interpretation, so on, I, yeah, I'd put it more, yes, you can gather lots of data, but you still have to um, use good judgment in determining uh, what it can do for you, and uh, it it comes down to using good good logic and good uh, uh, arguments as to um, what what it's actually telling you. Uh, but uh, no, there's been huge changes with regard to um, technology and and what kind of data we're able to get from from populations as hard to see as as snow leopard, for example. Um, Thank you, Joe. Thank you. So, sorry, you, I, I spoke over you. I'm so sorry. You were about to say something. No, I, I guess this will end fairly soon. And I just wanted to say one last thing. Uh, 
uh, I know Raghu had invited me and my my son and I were going to come come over there to India this summer for a kind of a reunion up in Ladakh, and the the COVID situation around the world has changed that. But I I hope in the not too distant future um, that that takes place because it would be wonderful to get back together with folks there. Of course. Yes, Joe. Uh, we have not cancelled it. We have postponed it. So <laughs> we're all, we are all looking forward to seeing you in India as well, uh, Joe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's the, the two good questions that have just come up. Um, yeah. I think one of them is oh, by the executive director of Snow Leopard Network. She's asking, we just looked back 40 years of Snow Leopard conservation. Now to looking ahead in the, in the next 40 years, uh, let's say till 2060, what would your vision be uh, about what should happen in the next 40 years? I know it's one of those... Uh, yeah, no, it's very important question because I think the model in India we've been following is very exclusive model. Uh, and it certainly doesn't work on snow leopard, which is based on protected area. So you set aside an area. And when we set aside those areas, we have no information what kind of, what kind of size is, uh, of protected areas required. So are they playing the role, conservation role we're supposed to do? Um, so I think the next future plan should be to have different conservation models working simultaneously. And these models should be more inclusive conservation models where we have community. Oops, I think we lost your voice. Um, Joe, uh, while we try to get Raghu reconnected, can you, uh, can you please sorry, address? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, you're sorry. back. Um, so I was saying that we need conservation model and, and con all allowing uh, to shift the fence in a position where communities on our side of the fence. Um, and we need those um, new models, not uh, um, because I feel that there's a time now we have to move because the protected area model which we have used have limited access, uh, provided limited access to the conservation, which is within the boundaries. So the areas which are outside the protected area to extend that conservation reach beyond that we need inclusive models. So I will be working and I'm now lobbying a lot and writing a lot about inclusive conservation models. Great. Joe, uh, how about you adding to it? Well, if you... I, I would just make the comparison with uh, another animal that, that we know well here in, in the United States and that is the, the mountain lion. Uh, and as Raghu mentioned, um, both the mountain lion, or both the snow leopard, which he's talking about, and the mountain lion have ranges. Uh, and to have viable populations, you generally need uh, larger areas than what are put in national parks and, and uh, strict conservation areas. But um, with good understanding of uh, the, the biology of these animals um, and good uh, wildlife protection laws and management. Uh, mountain lions live in throughout the Western United States um, in and outside of strict conservation areas. And uh, given the changes that are taking place in, with human populations and the use of lands up in the mountains of Snow Leopard Range, I think the the future is probably fairly reasonable for the maintenance of good snow leopard populations in those areas. Uh, I'm hopeful about that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. I just want to read out a beautiful message which has just come in from uh, Karmaji. That's how I call him. Uh, and uh, he's just saying that uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to listen to the legendary scientist Raghuji and especially Joe, uh, sir, for their surprise story of the journey to Ladakh's snow leopard landscape. I have heard a lot more about Joe, sir, never got the opportunity to see him uh, and still have lots of your equipment that was donated to the Ladakh uh, office uh, that we are still using during our field work. Uh, and uh, yes, so he, he, he's, uh, he's looking forward to seeing you both in Ladakh sometime soon. Great. Just, just wanted to share this, not a question, just wanted to men mention this beautiful message from Karma Sonam. 
I'm amazed this equipment is still lasting after 40 years. <laughs> they made things well around those days, I believe. <laughs> now taking care of them. So thank you very much, sir. Of course, of course. Great. So, uh, um, okay, so uh, maybe one last question from my side, if there's no other question from the audience is, uh, well, yeah, I, I just love those stories. Uh, forgive me for uh, being one of those uh, hungry for stories all the time. But uh, this picture, I think, uh, uh, is about one of the, your, uh, you know, favorite uh, experiences, I think, because, I mean, you, you must have, as you mentioned, you had an experience every day. Uh, but there was something special that you mentioned that you would like to talk about uh, when we discuss when we and we were looking at this picture. Uh, this is a it's a fantastic story, actually, Joe. And we wrote about it, um, uh, published an article. Maybe Joe, you would like to say something about this, Yuriche, how they took look look after the Nayan. In in where? Yuriche. Do you remember? Well, again, you're you're going to have to give me a little bit more information. You okay, go ahead. so I will now tell. You go ahead. Okay, I will tell. So, so basically, um, this is a single house um, uh, up in the about 2,400 to 200 meters above Rumbak, a um, uh, place called Yuruche. And there were three. I remember if correctly, there were three individuals um, um, turn up one day next next to the house and she kept on monitoring every day she used to go look after and they, she felt that they they are lost uh, and they are not uh, they are hungry so she set left some food for them they started coming back to that area she started feeding them regularly kept um, an eye um, and kind of she got very attached to this um, these animals so she used to go out looking for them if they she is not seen for a day and um, go and then uh, she will mm, take the food, leave it to them. They will come. And slowly, slowly, slowly I think by the time we, we were there, when we were doing survey, these three, the population went to, grew to seven, I think. And then by the time when I left, um, I finished my PhD in 93, they were about 23 plus. They were in three groups. Um, I don't know how many are there now, but it's an, a story to just to tell how Ladakhis were there all uh, they, it, it was there in the culture to live with the human, with, with the wildlife, and without much conflict. Um, um, and it's something. It's a story which has touched me um, deeply because um, she was, as long as she was alive, she was always been watching animals, looking. If you needed information from Yuriche, you go and spend a night there, talk to her uh, during the dinner, and you will get everything every detail fantastic that that's so beautiful it almost uh, you know uh, it's like the bishnois of the ladakh landscape yeah. uh, the way yeah. you just mentioned it it's it's beautiful wonderful great um so there is one question i think this would be the last one and before rakhi or justine get upset start getting upset with me this is the last question i promise uh, from muzaffar kichlu uh, he's in jammu uh, he's asking um why, why did you switch over to tigers from snow leopards? That's a good one, actually. <laughs> um, a couple of things led to, I, I did move to completely. So um, see, when I joined faculty, WII, the first assignment was given to me was on tigers. Um, and uh, then I realized when I was writing a report, I realized that uh, something, information I needed was not available. For six months, I tried in Delhi. I must have gone many times. So I thought maybe we should have some information if we have to have some decision making, some information required. So I submitted a proposal. Um, so for five years, I kind of worked on Snow Leopard and also Tiger Project was there. I had a student who was um, working on tigers. I had the students working on Snow Leopard. But when I was working at Snow Leopard, I was so deficit of data and information, technology you notebook know, there. I want, I had so many questions which uh, I needed to answer as far as the large carnivore ecology is concerned. So I thought I will look, uh, work on some individual, uh, some of the species where I can collect good in, amount of information. And that's how then I took uh, study leave and went 
group Panna and went on to work on Tigers. Um, but by the time when I left uh, Rumbak, uh, which was doing very well, Rinchin was there. He was, uh, there was an organization, Snow Leopard Conservancy Trust India. Uh, they were doing fantastic work. So I, there, was, there was somebody to look after Rumbak and wildlife and Snow Leopard. Um, in good hand, I left. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you so much, Joe, for joining in. And real uh, a big uh, uh, thank you to all the participants who've joined in. Uh, I think this was a, I mean, to me, it was a very special conversation, uh, of course, to talk to the gurus. It can't get better than that. But, uh, and I hope it was enlightening and, and uh, informative for the other participants as well. So over to you, Justine. Thanks, uh, Kustub, and uh, really thank you, Raghu and Joe, for joining us, because I think uh, it's important as how you've helped us zoom out of, you know, our worldview, not thinking about last maybe decade or five years, but really think of snow leopard conservation in another context, the last 50 years, to see what has changed, like you said, threats, livelihoods, but also what haven't changed, like equipment, which is the same <laughs> as previously used. So we, I think I've gotten some really nice messages from participants and we are, we've really enjoyed hearing from you. So thank you. I hope that you both uh, capture this more in writing and more stories and, and let us know and we will share with our this members because we love uh, hearing from you and, and your thoughts uh, and perspectives, which are really important. So thank you both and to Kustub for providing that space. I just want to say before we say goodbye, um, that we are having updates from Nepal for our, la for our next webinar. Um, and we'll have a, a team a share, uh, a joint team of a younger conservationists who's just started working with snow leopards, joined with someone who has also been working for like 30 years, somehow in Nepal. So we've got this joint collaboration for next uh, session, which will be nice bringing those both perspectives together. Um, but yeah, before I, we say goodbye, I don't know if there's any final words, Raghu or Joe, you want to leave uh, the network before we say goodbye. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us um, and um, talking to Costa was a delight and um, we, we, it will, we look forward to, um, um, to the younger generation uh, and hopefully uh, it will grow the same rate and maybe double the rate, uh, the, the success story. We wish all the success to the Snow Leopard Network and the Snow Leopard Trust. Yeah. Joe, it I was good to, to hear your voice, Joe. I just want to uh, you know, uh, give a shout out to you, Justine and Raki, for, for, uh, for doing these, uh, uh, these regular webinars. I think this is so, so valuable to get back and to get in touch with all the people and, and have these interactions. Thank you to both of you, by the way. Must... Thank you, Raki. Thank you, Justine. Yeah, this Thank has been great. Thank you very much. Pleasure having you. Thank you, Joe and Raghu. I wish we could stay more and have coffee. We can have virtual <laughs> coffee afterwards. <laughs> thanks to all the participants. Uh, please stay in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.